The East Orlando Chamber is proud to join forces with Business Force, UCF, the Orlando Law Group, and WUCF to present the 2020 debate for Orange County District 5 Commissioner. As the leading resource in business advocacy, community engagement, and regional connectivity, covering 440 square miles of East Orange County, the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce is dedicated to supporting strong government and the political process on behalf of businesses throughout Central Florida. Business Force is Florida's regional political action committee. The committee supports businesses and good government in Central Florida. And as a sponsor of this event, the Business Force board members want to thank the candidates and thank you for participating in the political process and watching this significant debate in Orange County. Thanks again on behalf of Business Force. The Orlando Law Group is a full service law firm supporting estate planning, family law, bankruptcy, business issues, and more. As a proud community member of Central Florida, the Orlando Law Group is committed to offering hands-on care with expert knowledge to each client they serve. We will teach you in a room. We will teach you now on Zoom. We will teach you in a house. We will teach you with a mouse. We will teach you here or there. We will teach you because we care. Our moderator for the District 5 debate is WUCF's Steve Mort. Hello, I'm Steve Mort, and welcome to the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce Orange County District 5 debate. District 5 in the east of the county is experiencing many of the challenges our state and region face during these unprecedented times. We'll be discussing some of the important issues that matter to voters ahead of primary election day on August 18th. Joining this debate are the three candidates running for District 5 Commissioner, incumbent Emily Bonilla of Orlando, Mike Miller of Winter Park, and Anjali Vire, also of Winter Park. Each candidate will get one minute to answer each question. If one candidate mentions another in that answer, that candidate will get 30 seconds to respond. You'll have a minute each for opening statements, first of all. We'll go in alphabetical order and start with Emily Bonilla. Emily. Hi, my name is Emily Bonilla. I'm the current Orange County Commissioner at District 5. I'm running for re-election. I first ran in 2016 because I wasn't happy with the commissioner at the time. I live in a rural area, and he was trying to build an urban development in the rural area, which was not right for the area. I got together an organization. We got over 10,000 petition signatures, and he still wasn't listening to us. After running and winning in 2016, I've accomplished a lot in my first term. Some of those things were getting developers to go around wetlands rather than filling them in and also getting $20 million for children's services. That was a year effort fighting for children's services because I was raised in poverty as a child, and so that was very important to me. And during this pandemic, I saw the need for local government funding so that we could be able to help the people directly. And I worked with county commissioners across the nation with the National Association of Counties and was able to bring $243 million to Orange County, which that money right now is being used for small business grants and financial assistance for individuals and families. And you can learn more about me at bullfamily.com. Okay, Mike Miller, you now have one minute for your opening statement. Well, thank you to the Chamber, and thank you to Steve for hosting, and uh, thanks to the candidates for being here with me, Commissioner Benia. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to uh, have a conversation about what I think is best for District 5. So I've raised my family here. I've been here for over 20 years. I actually had the pleasure to serve in the Florida legislature representing a large part of District 5 including the area of College Park, Winter Park, uh, Baldwin Park, and, uh, and down through downtown Orlando. I realize that East Orange County has its own challenges, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to run for, this, for the county commission, is to talk about how we can handle growth in an appropriate manner, while, again, doing what's most important in this uh, day and age, and that is stopping the spread of the virus and hoping to get our businesses back up on their feet in a timely manner. Again, I'm you know, very proud to be a part of, of, of Central Florida. I've worked with Mayor Dyer. I've worked with Mayor Demings. I've worked with uh, community leaders like Andre Bailey and, and Candy Crawford, uh, the folks out of UCF Restores on some mental health issues while in the legislature. And I think my life experience and my time in public service, including 17 years here in Winter Park on the Housing Authority, give me a unique perspective on the challenges and the, uh, the opportunities for Central Florida. All right. And Anjali Vaya, you now have one minute for your opening statement. 
Thank you for having me here. So uh, I have a very unique background. I actually came into this country with just a suitcase, a scholarship, and a big dream. Earning my degrees was a challenge. I've had to do many odd jobs just to pay my bills. Um, today, um, I do own a technology company with employees, and I'm the only candidate that's a business owner in this race. My experience coming from a third world country in Africa, um, you know, you had very, very um, hard, challenging times of not even having the basic necessities necessities of life, like healthcare, education. My father, who is my inspiration and my mentor, was a medical doctor there, um, working with the mission groups at, an early t at a very early age. He taught me what it meant to give back to the community. I was fortunate enough to work with him in an HIV base camp, which to me today, um, being in this coronavirus um, pandemic, reminds me of my days in Africa, where we didn't have any control of what was going on in the 90s. We really didn't know what, what was happening. Um, was there, there wasn't any um, treatments for HIV back then. So I had actually had hands-on experience with my father, putting resources together, working with him on the field. Okay, getting your, your, your minute is up on, on, the, uh, on the opening statements, I'm afraid. Uh, with that, I want to get right into questions. Uh, so alphabetically, Mr. Miller, you'll go uh, first on this uh, opening question. If elected, what would be your top two priorities as county commissioner for the upcoming term? Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the preamble there, I, I do believe that we have to stop the spread of this virus. It has obviously put the whole world on pause, and we have had, you know, just an, un, an unmeasurable amount of tragedy. Uh, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not only a, you know, here in Florida, but it's all over the world, and it, and it needs to, it need, we need to do our part in Central Florida to, to stop the spread uh, by wearing a mask, by honoring social distancing, by doing the things that, that we, we have learned from science and facts. Again, you got to follow science and facts. To, to break the back of the uh, of the virus, and then ultimately we've got to get back to work. I mean, one of the one of the long term problems we're going to have from this pandemic is unemployment and and the ability to pay uh, you know rent and the ability to pay our, our uh, you know all the, the costs of of living life. So I would work very hard to make sure small businesses, big businesses, everybody can get back to work in a safe manner while protecting vulnerable populations. And Anjali Via, that same question to you. I, my main focus would be safely opening the economy and making sure that we are, um, you know, advocating the safety measures. Um, we do have to get control of this virus, and we definitely, being in government, have to have ways um, of measurable, um, quantitative ideas, being a little more innovative than we currently are, having more communication streams. Um, just like I said, with my um, pandemic experience from Africa, most of it comes from communication of how good you are are um, on getting the messaging out. Um, being a business owner, I'm working with the hospitality sector as well as medical offices right now. And I will tell you that all of them are taking great measures to make sure that they're getting safely opened. I mean, they are open and, and we have to keep going at that route as well as affordable housing. That's going to be a, a big issue as well. Um, knowing that a lot of, uh, we have a lot of unemployment and we really don't know what our, our numbers are looking like as far as is um, what we're going to be forecasting. So being in this commission is going to be very important to have somebody that understands budgets, that understands how to care for the people, be okay. hands on. So yes. Your, your, your minute is up there. Uh, Emily Bonilla, how about you? If you're re-elected, what will your top pr uh, two priorities be? Well, a lot of things I've already been working on, I'm definitely going to continue working on them because we're not done yet. And with the pandemic, there's a lot of things that we're going to have to change how we were doing business, as using as a phrase, in Orange County and the world, things are going to change and we have to adapt with that. We do have the pandemic that we, we're dealing with right now and definitely recovery is going to be the biggest focus, but we still have to deal with other issues like affordable housing and diversifying our economy. And diversifying our economy will help with recovery. Um, affordable housing is definitely something that we can't ignore just because of the pandemic that we're in. We have to continue moving forward on that. And that's something that you know, I've definitely been working on the last four years. And smart growth, that has to do with affordable housing as well and our transportation. And so we have to look at that more innovatively going forward because of the pandemic is changing a lot. And we could take the opportunity to maybe encourage more people to work from home, get people off the roads. And with our smart growth, you know, we may be able to look at that differently okay. considering more people could work from home. 
Okay, um, you, you all mentioned uh, COVID-19 uh, in your opening answers, and I'm interested next, and this, first, this question goes to Anjali Via first. Uh, what COVID-19-related future impacts do you think the county should be preparing for in the long term? Anjali Via, that goes to you first. Yeah, I, I think that we're going to be impacted um, financially. So um, most of the businesses that I work with right now in hospitality, um, as well as the medical offices, are seeing their revenues um, have dropped by close to 60 to 80 percent. My own business, I'm down by 80 percent in revenues right now. So um, what is the county going to do? Because, you know, whether it's jobs, um, it's job creation, as well as sustaining, because this could be economically devastating if if we carry on with this route. So it's very important for us to be looking at our measurables right now and looking at ways to start um, not just keeping these businesses open, but to have ways to where they'll there'll be consumer um, walk-ins and you know, consumer um, the consumer related um, uh, messaging to say that you're safe, you're okay. So we're going to have to adapt, you know, restaurants, for example, how are they doing businesses, hotels, how how are tourists going to get back in? I mean, there's just a lot of economic impacts that we're looking at that need to start being addressed before we go into a crisis mode. So I would okay. like to see more measurables. Okay. Uh, Emily Benia, uh, how about you? What future impacts do you think we should be preparing for in, in the long term? Yeah, definitely our industries are going to change how they're doing things. Um, I mentioned that before. My background, I did business consulting, especially for women around the world. So all this online virtual work from home is something that's not new to me. And it's something that I've even offered to consult businesses now on how they can do this uh, moving into the future. But that's something that we're really going to have to look at. Businesses are going to have to learn how to work with people working from home. And also, we're going to have to train our workforce, which is something where that $243 million is always also going to workforce training, because people are going to have to learn new skills in order to work in this new world that we live in. And I worked at Full State University, working with graduates, training them, helping them learn how to find new jobs, and also attracting businesses to Orange County, working with them, and, and what the benefits are moving to Orange County, something I did at Full State University and something I do now as a commissioner as well. And Mike Miller, how about you? Uh, the same question to you. Well, it is going to be a new norm. And I can tell you firsthand, because I work at the Florida Virtual School, and we're seeing an uptick uh, uh, with children, uh, K-12 kids, who are, who are looking to a new way of going to school. And online education is obviously been forced upon us by the pandemic. But I think a lot of people are going to realize that that's a great opportunity to have a new way to learn. And I think in some cases, for children, it'll be a great opportunity for, for kids to learn in a new and a, a more progressive way. At the same time, just like we talked about uh, here, the, you know, the economy is going to have to create a, probably a new way of doing business, maybe virtually, uh, you know, maybe a combination, a blended, as we call it, in the education world. And I think that's going to change a lot of the way we get back to work. But the most important thing is we've got to stop the spread and get folks back to work, because if we don't do that in a timely manner, we're going to, we're going to get ourselves in a hole that's going to take years and years to get out. So we need to figure out we not stop the spread, get us back to work. The sooner we can do that, the sooner a lot of our issues will hopefully resolve themselves. Okay, I want to ask another question uh, about a story that's been in the news uh, recently. There's been a lot of discussion about the future of policing uh, in recent weeks. Uh, I'm going to send this question first to Emily Bonilla. Uh, do you believe law enforcement should be defunded or reduced in our community? Every county is different, and every municipality is also different in how they handle their policing and how it's even funded. So you can't treat, you can't say something and blanket it across the whole nation because we're all different in how we fi finance our policing. Here in Orange County, the sheriff's department is funded by their own MSTU and our property taxes. But I will say that since the Great Recession, we're still at those levels of staffing in our sheriff's department. We don't have enough sheriffs to really handle the population growth that we've had. And so we do need to hire more sheriffs. We're not like other counties that's been stagnant in their population growth. And I hear all the time from my constituents that we need more police presence or sheriff presence because the, the response times are high. So as county commissioner, I've gotten more sheriffs um, into my district. The response times have lowered and crime has lowered because of my engagement with the sheriff's office and my constituents. And uh, Mike Miller, what, what do you think about that? Do you believe law enforcement should be uh, defunded or reduced? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think 
I think one of the pillars of our society is law and order. And I think one of the things that we uh, that we need to be very uh, cognizant of is the fact that we put a lot of pressure pressure on our deputies to do a lot of things in our community. And I know we've been through a lot in our society in the last few months. Uh, and, and as uh, Commissioner Benia said, every community is different. But I do think we've had the great blessing of having a great sheriff for the past 10 years and, and now our mayor, Mayor Demings, and our current sheriff, John Mina, who is doing everything right. We, we ban chokeholds. We're talking about changing policies. We're talking about doing some things that nationally has been brought to our attention. But I, I agree with, with uh, Commissioner Bonilla that, you know, having a strong and robust uh, uh, law enforcement, having the ability to, to, to get to a, a situation in a timely manner, those are, those are paramount to keeping our, our constituencies safe. And I would, I would never consider defunding the police. As a matter of fact, I would help them manage some of the, because they end up handling a lot of different things, not just a, a, a law enforcement action. A lot of times they're there to, because they're the first people, the first responder to a situation. So we need to be very respectful and, and conscientious about how we train our deputies and how we fund them. And Anjali Vaya, uh, what's your perspective? I would have to agree. I do agree with um, Commissioner Bonilla that um, we definitely need to, to keep our law and enforcement um, in place and have it funded correctly. Um, I have been canvassing in this um, district for over, uh, close to a year now and have found that in the east, as well as some other areas that are not municipalities, that we are shorthanded on, um, on sheriffs. Um, so there is a lot of, um, just like Commissioner Bonilla said, the lead, lead times are very high. And this is something that needs to be worked collaboratively with um, Sheriff Mina, um, you know, with with the new or the new sheriff um depending on the elections but we do need to look at these um numbers closely working together collaboratively collaboratively and making sure that the sheriff's offices are funded and like she mentioned our growth is um we're a growing city so these um, numbers are just going to keep going up as far as needing to be protected by law and enforcement okay. so yes i do agree that we need the funding Okay. Um, um, can I, I, since my name was mentioned twice, can I say something? Yes, you, yes, yeah. you can. Please do. Yeah, so I also wanted to say some part of the defund the police is about putting more money into social services, which is why I worked really hard to get $20 million in additional funding for children's services. Um, social funding is really important. We're also, I'm trying to work on getting more funding for mental illness as well. And this is something that before I got elected wasn't a priority, getting funding for social services and different services that the people need in order to improve their lives. And I was able to push for that. Okay. Um, I want to uh, move on to issues around the budget uh, next. And this question goes first to Mike Miller. In light of the uh, shortfall in tourist development tax funds amid the COVID-19 pandemic, do you see the impact on the county's budget and current projects? What do you see as that impact? Well, uh, as we talked about yesterday in our, our conversation with the Orlando Sentinel, I have a lot of conversation centers around the convention center and what we're going to do there and how we're going to fund that through TDT funds. And I do think that is a very interesting conversation to have because it's a, a part of the broader conversation about our budget. You know, we, uh, when I served in the Florida legislature, we were very conscientious about the fact that we have to have a balanced budget, just like we do here in the county. And so you have to make tough choices. And with the reduce, with reductions in, uh, in revenue, it becomes paramount to try to figure out how we keep our, our community safe, how we can still try to fund social services for those that are the most needy, and then at the same time, try not to, you know, we, 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 you know, we gotta make do with less. So uh, I think the challenge is gonna be in the, in the coming days to see what how fast we can get out from underneath this, uh, this epidemic, uh, this pandemic, and then figure out a way we can get people back to work in a timely manner. And I know that Mayor Demings is trying very hard. I know he's trying to figure out ways to, um, to get folks in a place where they're safe and then they can get back to work in a safe manner. I, I, do, I do believe, and I do believe uh, that we will get through this and we will have a stronger economy than ever. And when we do that, then we can talk about TDT monies and, and the way we use them. Uh, but quite That's frankly, right. right now, we've just got to get through the pandemic. Uh, Anjali Vaya, that question to you. 
Yes, the two, I do work with the hospitality sector um, with my technology company. And because budgets are being mentioned, I did want to ask um, Commissioner Bonilla what business consulting she actually does, because her financial records and disclosures from 2016 do not show any business that she has owned. Um, they've just been political organizations. Um, I do own a business. I do look at budgets and I do do payrolls. And I have seen that how we budget and how we use our dollars are going to be very important we need to make sure every dollar is accounted for right now in the pandemic. I would also like to note, because we are talking about budgets, that Ms. Bonilla's, um, Commissioner Bonilla's budget in her District 5 office is actually costing the taxpayer um, on risk management because of her inefficiency of working with her employees. It's costing us 14 times more than any other seated commissioner. Her um, office budget for risk management that we are paying for right now is at um, the other offices are office seats are at three three hundred dollars she is at six thousand so because of her inability to work with others okay. we are paying that amount and and every okay, amount I, I have to stop you you're over a minute but uh, I want to give uh, Emily Benier a chance to respond you have uh, a minute 30 here your minute to answer the question and uh, also including the 30 seconds that you have to respond okay can I start with the 30 seconds first certainly Okay, thank you. So yes, the business consulting that I've done, I done, like I said, mostly women working around the world. And I would look at companies with their, their budget sheets, their, their balance sheets, their employees, what products and marketing they were doing. I would look at all of it and show them how they could do things more efficiently and make more money. Um, I had to stop that when I became a county commissioner because I didn't want that there to be any conflicts of interest with all the businesses I was working for. And so that's why as when I became county commissioner, you don't see that in my resume anymore. Um, as far as the, the risk management, it, it was high even before the, any employee I, I fired. Um, I did fire someone within the first couple of months of being elected. And because of a lawsuit with that, which I'm not going to speak on, um, but it was a disgruntled employee who was trying to find some other excuse for why I fired him. And that's why the risk management is... Um, rate is high. So okay. that's for 30 seconds. Right. <laughs> uh, you, so now you, you, had, you had a minute on, on that. The... You had a minute on that. Uh, so, so uh, yes, please do answer the main question. You have uh, about 20 seconds. Yeah, so on revenues, we, the staff is really great about looking at all of our expenses and advising us on where we should place the money, where we shouldn't, where we could cut. And they're really working on, we really look to our staff to be there. They've done this for over 20, 30 years, uh, but we're definitely going to have to prioritize what's important to us. And that's always, that's always runs the budget. What's our priorities as a board of county commissioners? What's important to us? Okay, the next question uh, goes to Anjali Via first. Uh, would you support expanding the use of tourist development tax revenues uh, into areas such as education, uh, transportation, and public safety? What's your feeling there? So since I do work with the hospitality sector and knowing that these small businesses are suffering right now, um, I, given the current crisis, um, we would have to, again, look at the numbers of where they stand. Because right now, um, that money really needs to be utilized on making sure that economically we are um, sustaining ourselves and have a future. Um, the hospitality sector is our life engine. Um, we um, haven't diversified our lifelines to where we can um, look at um, other you know, I, I don't agree. I would not currently, given the situation, no, I would not want to use those funds in any other way, but to make sure that currently we economically are making an impact, utilizing those funds and helping the small businesses. And, you know, coming from a technology sector, again, we might have to look at virtual um, ways and, and, you know, what is it going to take for them to carry on with um, consumer confidence and, and making sure that they have revenues. And that money really needs to be utilized every penny to make sure that the corridor is back, it's revived okay. and, and it's doing well. Okay, uh, Emily Benia, that, that one to you. What do you think about uh, expanding the use of those uh, tourism development tax dollars? Well, at the moment, those dollars have been cut by 97% because of the pandem pandemic. And that money really benefits the small businesses and the hospitality industry, the tourism industry. 
And they're really going to need whatever's left of that in order to help recover. So we're going to have to focus that money in helping our tourism industry recover, especially the arts and culture, um, cultural industry. They've been suffering really hard, and that's a place where we could also use this money to be able to help them recover. And Mike Miller, how about you? I'm, I'm in agreement. I think the tourism tax development money is, uh, has a purpose, and it was designed in the statute to be just to that, to try to help the tourism industry uh, remain strong, especially because a lot of small businesses rely on the I, uh, I Drive corridor uh, and, and the Universals and Disney's and those folks. They bring tens of millions of people to our community, but they don't always just go to Disney or Universal. They spend their time all over Central Florida, and that tourism development money is is, is paramount to making sure that more and more people come here, especially post-pandemic. And it may be a different way to come here, uh, but I do think we still need to, to highlight all the positives, all the outdoor, we're the Sunshine State, all the great outdoor things you can do here uh, to, to, uh, to enjoy and, and to bring economic viability to our, to our community. So we have, we have to make sure we protect our TDD. Okay, moving on. The next question goes to Emily Bonilla first. Uh, do you think there are Orange County public services that are good candidates for private contracting? And if so, which ones? Well, I will tell you that um, I'm not going to mention any specific companies, but Orange County, we're not staffed to be able to do everything we need to do. So we do have to contract with private companies in order to get the work done. We can't do it ourselves. Um, but, if, you know, I, I try not to name, you know, companies and support private companies as a elected official. I try to be fair to everybody. Uh, Mike Miller, do you think there are public services that are that are good candidates for private contracting? I don't have a specific in, in my mind right this moment, but I just know from my experience working at the Florida Virtual School that we we contract a lot with private vendors to uh, to provide educational services. So I think it's a usual and customary thing to do in government. I mean, we're a public school district, so I don't think it's it actually would be if you're talking about saving taxpayer money, if you're talking about doing something in a more efficient manner. I don't think there's a better position for a commissioner to be in than to try to find those solutions. So uh, as I, I, were I to be elected to the commission, I think I would always be open-minded to the idea of bringing more efficiency and lower costs to government, because that's usually a big challenge no matter where you are. And Anjali Vaya, how, how about you? What do you think? I mean, there's always um, contracts that are taking place with, with the government. So again, dependent on what the um, what the dollar amounts are and looking at the budgets, if you are able to save money, because um, when you are putting an open bid, um, being a businesswoman, I'll tell you, you want a competitive space to where the government can't um, offer solutions to everything. So yes, um, you know, if there is an opportunity to where you have a problem, specifically now going into technology and looking at everything being so virtual, the government's not going to be able to hire people that can do everything efficiently. It would cost too much on on the on the um, to the taxpayer, so I would um, look at what we what our needs are and put a competitive bid there and see what our needs are. And I would definitely um, advocate for it. You know, if it is if it makes sense. Okay, I want to move on to another issue that's a, a real hot button issue in our region, and that is transportation. This question goes to Mike Miller first. It's getting close to the time when the county is required to start covering those operating shortfalls for Sunrail. What is your position on how the county should cover this multi-million dollar expense? Well, actually, I, you know, I was for Sunrail when it first came through Winter Park, and it was controversial and all up and down the, the spine here in Central Florida. And I give great credit to John Micah for trying to think ahead. And, and maybe this is an unintended consequence of the post-pandemic uh, situation, because uh, how people are going to get to work, how people are going to communicate, uh, you know, or uh, 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 you know, get themselves around from place to place, we, we probably need to take a look at what that's going to do uh, with Sunrail, because we did put the county, uh, you know, or excuse me, the, the you know, the, the, the municipalities and the county on the hook to try to figure out how to pay for the uh, for the long-term use of the rail. So that, that's going to be an interesting conversation to have because it's not just the county that's going to have to pick up the cost for that. So I think the communication between the commission, the different municipalities that rely on the Sunrail uh, stations in their communities, we're going to have to come up with an equitable way to make it all make, it all make sense. But I think it would be very interesting to have a long-term conversation about how people get around our community uh, post-pandemic uh, and, 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 you know, mass transportation or, you know, uh, Things like Sunrail and, and Lynx are important. Uh, they're, they're very important, especially for our service industry workers. So I will always try to look for the best and cheapest and cleanest way to get to work. 
Okay. Uh, Anjali Vaya, uh, do you have a, a plan for covering that shortfall? Well, um, you know, mass transit, um, like M Mike Miller had said, it is definitely needed with our projected growth. But currently, with the pandemic, um, looking for the funds is our challenge. Yes, I, you know, I would recommend, you know, having a dedicated actual fund for it, just like the mayor had proposed. Um, but right now, again, because of the pandemic, it's come off. Um, as long as it's not a tax burden to the residents of Orange County, and it would need to be voted in, um, and my recommendation would be to lower the property taxes. While we're at the subject, though, I did want to mention that Commissioner Bonilla, when the subject of transportation had come up, I did not like her stand that she wanted um, our taxes to actually go up because she was um, in the... Um, going towards um, free rides and free links, and I'm not sure where she thought the money was going to come from because that's a taxpayer's burden. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, Emily Vanier, you've got uh, 30 seconds to respond to that first. Well, I'll answer that within the question, too. Um, unfortunately, you know, she does understand how the, the taxes work. Um, so we have impact fees, and impact fees are fees that really we're growing a lot, and so when we build new apartments, new houses, it's for people who are really coming here. It's not for the people who are already here. And the Greater Orlando, Greater Orlando Builders Association is always lobbying against us increasing our impact fees. Our transportation impact fees have been discounted at 56% since the Great Recession. And the excuse for that was to encourage more development, cheaper development, and that hasn't happened. We don't have more affordable housing because that has happened. So we need, so when I had that discussion on the board, that was about increasing those impact fees to 100% and charging our developers 100% of that transportation impact fee. Because right now the taxpayers are subsidizing that and the taxpayers shouldn't be subsidizing that. And if they were paying their impact, their full impact fees, that money could be, well, the money that we're using to subsidize could be used for Sunrail, and that's the plan. And so, you know, the, the, the Greater Orlando Builders Association, they have been lobbying against the increase in any impact fees and using the excuse that we need more affordable housing. We can't have affordable housing if we do that. And they, they picked their candidate for this race. Okay. Uh, I want to ask about another transportation issue. This one goes to Anjali via first. Uh, what are your thoughts on an extension of State Road 408 going further east? At the moment, it ends at Research Park. What do you think about that? I would actually, so I did sit in August and September, and I have been um, speaking with some of the engineers as well on this um, project. And um, while I was even canvassing, because this was something that um, I had also attended a town hall on it, which I, may I add, over 600 residents were there in the town hall, and Commissioner Bonilla was not there. As usual, her aides were there. Um, however, um, when I spoke to the residents, most of them agreed that we do need that extension. Um, and and we do, it, it's going to actually provide, um, it would It would definitely help with the traffic congestions that they're having in the area. Now, you know, there were some concerns about some of the houses and, you know, there were some specifics that some of the residents were concerned about. But overall, you know, the majority have liked the idea. They're supporting it. And again, you always have to listen to the constituents and the voters um, on the people that actually live there, the residents and what they want. And it does look like it's something that would really help alleviate a lot of the congestion in the the area, so I would support it. Okay. Um, Emily Bonilla, uh, you were mentioned again in that answer. I'm going to give you a minute 30, including that 30 seconds uh, to, to respond. Yeah, well, my time is, I can only be in one place at one time, and they don't always ask me what my schedule is when they plan these, these town halls. That's the Florida Department of Transportation. They're not going to coordinate with me my schedule. Um, so I can't be everywhere. And when I can't be everywhere, I send my, my staff in my place. I, I live out there. I live out in the east side. And I will tell you that we pay a lot of tolls to get to where we need to go to already. Um, so the people out there are not in favor of paying more tolls to get to where they have to be, especially since a lot of them are low income. They live on fixed income with disability, um, retired. So they, they cannot afford more tolls. 
But I will say it's definitely a complex situation because of the GROW that was approved before I was elected in which I fought really hard against. And the traffic that they're going to bring on the roads, we definitely need more capacity for. And the Lake Picket North, which I was able to stop after I got elected, they, wanted, they actually came into my office and sat down with me. They wanted to talk about applying for that again. And I said, well, what's different with the traffic situation? Nothing. So what are you going to do to fix that? And they went away and they pulled their application and they're waiting to un until after the elections to try to come back again. Um, so we cannot handle more more urban growth um, with the transport with the roads that we have out there. And right now that project actually has been stalled um, there. It was okay. it was considered not feasible. Yep. That's 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 your minute. Uh, I uh, wanted to ask that question finally to uh, Mike Miller. So uh, 20 years ago, I was part of the PD&E study that looked at how to get across the Wakaiwa River uh, with, the, uh, with the 429 that's coming and became what's known as the Western Beltway. So I see a similar conversation happening here. And I do know that it's a controversial situation because we have a quality of life in East Orange County that a lot of the residents are trying to uh, you know, hold on to. And, and I have great respect for that. At the same time, if we do that road right, the 408, and we do it in a proper manner. It can be a it can be a, a, a lifeline to those people that need to get in and out of there without the congestion that I'm, uh, 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 Commissioner Bonilla was talking about. But at the same time, can also be respectful to the environment because we can do it as a raised parkway. But you can do it limited access. There's ways to do that because there's going to be a lot of population uh, pressure as we move east, especially trying to get all the way out to Titusville, which ultimately I think there's a lot of that commuting. Uh, the commuting is going to be uh, be using the 408s coming from the coast. All right. And with that, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about development and growth in Orange County. We'll be right back. The East Orlando Chamber is proud to join forces with Business Force, UCF, the Orlando Law Group, and WUCF to present the 2020 debate for Orange County District 5 Commissioner. As the leading resource in business advocacy, community engagement, and regional connectivity, covering 440 square miles of East Orange County, the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce is dedicated to supporting strong government and the political process on behalf of businesses throughout Central Florida. Business Force is Florida's regional political action committee. The committee supports businesses and good government in Central Florida. And as a sponsor of this event, the Business Force board members want to thank the candidates and thank you for participating in the political process and watching this significant debate in Orange County. Thanks again on behalf of Business Force. The Orlando Law Group is a full-service law firm supporting estate planning, family law, bankruptcy, business issues, and more. As a proud community member of Central Florida, the Orlando Law Group is committed to offering hands-on care with expert knowledge to each client they serve. We will teach you in a room. We will teach you now on Zoom. We will teach you in a house. We will teach you with a mouse. We will teach you here or there. We will teach you because we care. All right, welcome back to the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce, Orange County District 5 debate. We're going to talk about development and growth in this segment. And the first question goes to Mike Miller. We talked before the break about transportation. What other infrastructure or capital projects do you see as pressing needs in the county? Uh, you're asking me about specifics. <laughs> I don't think that's really in this situation what I was coming to talk about. I was coming to talk about how I have a, have a reasonable conversation about what's the long-term direction of the county, and particularly District 5. And I do think that smart growth, managed growth, a lot of the conversations I've had in East Orange County with the residents are how do we handle that? How do we communicate? And I think that's one of the challenges that a commissioner, like I, I know my past public uh, service, I, I have uh, been very fortunate to have lots of great relationships in East Orange County with a lot of the community leaders that would give me the, in, the feedback that I need in order to make a, a reasoned decision. So I'm not prepared at this point to say, here, here's a project I want to do, or here's a, uh, other than the thing we talked about in the last segment with the 408, I do think we do need to talk about that as a, as a long-term project. But the, uh, the, as, as projects come up as a commissioner, you have to be able to find the resources in the community to get the feedback from the residents and then figure out what is in the best interest of your constituents on a whole. So that's what I would do as your next commissioner. Uh, Angeli Vaya, uh, do you have any uh, particular infrastructure projects in, in mind that you think are particularly pressing needs? 
Well, coming from a technology sector again, um, I am quite disappointed with where our, um, to how I call it a dinosaur world that the government technology um, systems work on. So one of the, you know, one of the things that I would like to see is to bring efficiency because technology does, you know, it does reduce costs and it brings efficiency into how we manage government. So that would be something that I would be interested in looking into. Um, but that's not a specific project. As far as projects are concerned, we have to realize that District 5 is, it's, it's a very large and very diverse district. It has an urban area as well as a very rural, um, you know, a, a rural area to it. So as a commissioner, you have to balance the growth as well as the quality of life. And that is what I would look at first before any project comes up. And that question to Emily Benia. Hey, can you repeat the question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, Emily Benia, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry. Yes, certainly. Emily Bonilla, uh, before the break, we talked about transportation. What other infrastructure or capital projects do you see as pressing needs in the county? Well, as far as specific projects, so I had community meetings all across our district. And I also communicate with them with a newsletter that I send out every two weeks. And I get a lot of feedback. Right now with the pandemic, actually doing every two weeks a virtual town hall where I get questions and but with those community meetings I've had across the district, one thing that I found the need for was community centers and meeting spaces. A lot of people want some space that they can meet. So I am working on getting a community center in Blanchard Park. That's one project that I'm working on. I'm working on expanding. I already got the funding for expanding the Bithlow Community Center because they wanted more space in order to do um, like Pilates and different um, exercise um, training there. Um, I'm doing a multi-room, multi-use room there in case people want to also use it for computers or any other uses. So those are a couple of projects that I'm working on that's not related to transportation since we already talked about that. All right. So next question goes to Anjali Via first. Companies that choose to relocate or expand in Orange County are key to its economic growth. As our region looks to uh, or for ways to diversify its economy, what are your plans to attract new jobs to the county? Again, coming from uh, b being a successful business owner in the technology sector, um, I'm all about diversifying our lifelines right now. We can't just be looking at the hospitality sector. Um, smart growth is is one of the um, areas that you know I find that with UCF, with you know we sit with UCF, Valencia, Rollins, all in this um, district in District Five, and um, I actually hire um, interns and and um, students from there in the IT sector and. And one of the main concerns that we find with the students is that I can't retain them because we don't have any any jobs, anybody, any um, companies moving into Orange County that can offer them um, the higher paying jobs that the other cities offer. So retaining our um, talent pool is one of the most important things, specifically being that UCF is here, as well as um, we need to diversify. We need to diversify and have research corridors and invest in our future. And Emily Bonilla, what are your plans to, to attract new jobs to the county? Yeah, so my experience working with Full Sail University was to work with graduates and help them either create a job or find a job. And that was nationwide. I actually worked with graduates nationwide because Full Sail University had a, the program I was working on was virtual. Um, I also worked with businesses who wanted to relocate here. And one of the things that they would always bring up is that the qual they wanted a quality of life of where they were moving to for their employees. And so that's what I bring up with the job that I have at Smart Growth is that we have to make sure that we have a good quality of life. And that's how we're going to be able to attract people here. If people, if their employees are sitting in traffic and they can't be home with their families, they're not going to want to move their business here. And so that's definitely something we have to look at. But I would say um, competing with other cities across our country they have higher wages um, for the cost of living that's there. And so a lot of those, those younger folks would want to move over there because they could get more for their money. And that's definitely an issue that we have here in Orange County. And Mike Miller, your plans to attract new jobs to the county? Well, it's been a challenge in Central Florida for 
all my time here, 20 plus years, that we need to diversify our economy. We have a heavily dependent on tourism, which is a wonderful thing. It's the golden goose. But we've always been saying to ourselves in the community, and I've been working on this in my time in the legislature, is how can we, how can we find other businesses to move here? And I give great credit to UCF for trying to grow and incubate new businesses. I know we have uh, places like Full Sail University, as the commissioner mentioned, that are trying to gr grow the next generation of, of movie, uh, uh, you know, and the movie industry, by the way, is, it would be a great diversification for us. The, the ultimate goal here is, you know, the founding fathers had it right. We are competing am amongst the 50 states, and I would argue we're com competing here amongst the 67 counties. And I think Orange County is one of the best places to live. We have challenges with our schools, and we have challenges with our with our living wages, but we're going to work on that. And I think the reason that the companies are going to want to move here is because we're going to have commissioners like myself that are pro-business, and we want you to move here. We want you to bring your families here because we're going to make it a very family-friendly environment and a business-friendly environment by reducing regulations and bringing you here to grow your business. Okay, well, a couple of you there mentioned uh, UCF, and the next question is about UCF. Well, this I, goes to Emily. Can yes, I apologize. Please can do. Can I respond? For, sure. My name was... 30 seconds. Yes. So Full Sail University doesn't only do the movie industry. They also do a lot of um, business degrees as well. But we had the film incentive here in Florida, and we were going to be the next Hollywood, and we were growing our film industry here. But when that film incentive was taken away, that took away a lot of the jobs. And some of the graduates in the film school at Full Sail University, I had to divert them to other places for work because all the work in the film industry was lost here when that incentive was taken away. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next question. Uh, Emily Bonilla, this one is to you first, and it pertains to UCF. Uh, with the uh, Central Florida Research Park next to UCF playing a critical role in supporting the nation's largest modeling, simulation, and training economic cluster, how can Orange County, in your view, best continue to support that industry? Uh, we have such a potential there, and we could have so many more jobs come in. They, they're not fully developed. And so I actually sit on the board um, with the research park, and we've been trying to discuss how to fix the transportation issues we have around there, because that's what's, like I said earlier, that's what's preventing <laughs> businesses from being able to invest and move into this area. It's because the transportation is so bad. Um, they don't want their employees sitting in traffic. So I've been trying to work with them, and we do have some conflicts because the, the Navy base is also there, and they because of security, we can't do what we want with transportation. So I do have some plans, but because of the security issues, we're not able to do it. Um, so it's definitely a complex situation, but there is so much potential there, and I'm still working with them to try to find some solutions. And Mike Miller, how do you think uh, the, the county should uh, support that industry? You know, as a former congressional staffer, I went out to, uh, to the STRICOM and the modeling and simulation and all the incubator companies around, around the, uh, the base there. And it, it, it is a wonderful attribute for our community. And I would do everything I can as a commissioner to continue to support everything they're trying to do there. And then the, the ancillary businesses that come off of those incubator or come off of the, the military, they, they, they can create some of the next great uh, things in our generation. And that's one of the interesting things about, you know, I worked with Governor Scott, and, you know, I've got a lot of great relationships in the legislature right now about how to bring businesses in from other places. But you know what? Growing the next Google here or growing the next uh, Microsoft is even a better way to do it because it's hard to get those guys to move because nobody wants the, uh, you know, that the town they're coming from is going to fight back. So I, yeah, I think the idea of getting uh, the uh, that UCF incubator is is a is a golden gem that I would work very hard as a commissioner to continue to grow and to continue to look to diversify all around that uh, that research park to figure out the next the next Google or the next uh, the next big uh, Fortune 500 company. And Anjali Vaya, how do you think the county should uh, support that uh, simulation and, and training economic cluster? This has to be one of our priorities. And like I said, coming from the technology sector, I actually hire a lot of um, students. So um, we've been working with Florida Polytech right, Polytech right now, and um, we have a product line called, um, it's, a, it's a large kiosk that sits in 140 hotels, which most of the programming was done by these students. So we have to have incubators. I actually started my company um, out of an incubator. So we have to encourage innovation by creating the flexibility of business 
businesses to fully take advantage um, of, of these breakthroughs in science and technology. Um, it helps everyone. Um, so if we were encouraging, you can like just for myself, for example, I get so um, such a low cost on, on the products that we're developing right now. We actually have a virtual Zoom-like technology called Kazam that's coming out into the market space as well. So it's companies like myself that benefit from, from having these incubators and we have to support it because um, more businesses like myself that I'm able to provide these services to, the more we will succeed on, on increasing that um, dollar. Yeah, I have to, I have to so, stop wait. you there. Um, I, we need to move on to the next question and it actually pertains to an environmental issue uh, in the district. Uh, Mike Miller, you'll get this question first. What is your position on protecting land east of the Econ River from development and urban sprawl? And that's a that's a great question, and that's one of the keys in this uh, commission race. Is I, I really and I and I I've been very fortunate to be able to spend some time out there, and I actually was just out there this weekend, uh, and looking and thinking and believing in the concerns that have been going back now for twenty the, all twenty some years I've been here, and, and even pre previous to my uh, living in Central Florida. It is a big challenge because we have some beautiful wetlands there. We have some beautiful areas where we can have wildlife corridors, which I think is one of the keys to the whole conversation. Is you know just having a park or having <clears throat> set aside is not the key to this. The key to this is having a wildlife corridor where actually we can have full and robust uh, places for wildlife to, to live and, 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 uh, and have the next generation of their offspring live in a safe environment, which is why I mentioned in the earlier segment about, you know, putting a, uh, the portions of the 408 being a, a parkway rather than on the ground, like they're doing out on the, on the west side of town. So I think environmentally sensitive areas are, are going to be key to what make our play, our, which is why Central Florida is one of the most beautiful places in the country. We, we do very conscientiously protect those areas that we need to make sure that the wildlife can live and that we can keep pristine. And I will work on that as a commissioner. Uh, Anjali Vaya, uh, what's your position on protecting that land east of the Econ River? We must protect it. And, you know, speaking with the residents um, while I've been canvassing, this is a very important issue for them. Um, the county had made promises to them, and these promises should be kept. Um, we shouldn't be breaking them. Um, you know, this was it was it was something that was written. Um, and, and we should not be breaking that. Now, while I do say that, um, we do need a commissioner that can make sure that she collaboratively works, he or she works collaboratively with the board of um, director, with the current board, to make sure that when issues do come up, that these motions um, that you do have are actually passed. And, you know, working collaboratively will make a big difference um, because that's one of the issues that I have seen with Commissioner Bonilla on often not getting a second on her motions. So, you know, working again, um, having relationships is very important. So, yes, the, this is an important issue and you definitely need a commissioner that can get a second. OK, Emily Bonilla, I'm going to give you uh, a minute 30 to include 30 uh, seconds to respond. Yeah, I definitely do get seconds, um, not always, but there are very few situations. I mean, maybe one or two. Um, but I will say that the lobbyists, so they try to give money to the Board of County Commissioners in order to get us to vote their way. And you could watch my record. You know, people have given, given to my campaign. I've still voted no on. But sometimes... You know, they also give to the other commissioners, and there's a lot of pressure. And the Greater Orlando Builders Association, the developers, like I said, they chose their candidate. And all you have to do is go to the financial records of each candidate here, and you can find out who it is. Um, they put a lot of pressure on the board in order to... They, they basically control the county with all the campaign donations that they make, and that's something that really has to change in Orange County. And I cannot be bought. OK, uh, we're going to move on to uh, another question that uh, pertains to UCF. And, Anjali Vaya, you'll get this one first. Uh, Orange County and UCF have grown quickly over the last five decades. Uh, name one way that the county can best support UCF's continued growth and one way that UCF, importantly, can best support the county's future needs. What do you think? 
Well, I, you know, I work with a lot of Chamber of Commerce as well, and I do sit on the board of the Indian American Chamber of Commerce, and um, we, um, we've done a lot um, with UCF as, well, as far as private partnerships are concerned. So I'd like to see um, a little bit more of a focus of having these private sector pr partnerships um, evolve a little better um, and have, again, a very collaborative approach. Um, and UCF, like I said, has a huge talent pool on, on some various um, industry sectors. So getting those sectors more involved and, and being the commissioner in there to make sure that you're, um, you know, that you're, you're, you're enhancing those relationships and making sure that they move forward. So this is a, um, UCF is a big part of where we're heading and these partnerships are critical from um, corporate to businesses as well as UCF and its um, professors. Thank you. Uh, Emily Bonilla, wh uh, what do you think? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, over the last five decades, um, UCF has grown substantially. What do you think are the best ways that, uh, that UCF can support the county and, and the county can support UCF? Well, the way... It, it's, a very, um, it's a very complex relationship with UCF. Um, they really have a lot of control of what happens in their property and they're really not willing to invest in what happens outside of their property. But we've been able to work with them on an agreement to be able to help with the traffic situation, Alafia Trail, and the pedestrian safety. And we've been able to get out of them what we can with that. Um, but as far as supporting them, definitely with student housing is some way that I've been supporting them. We really have to make sure that we bring down the prices on student housing because it's very unaffordable. Um, also making sure that we have enough student housing because a lot of the communities around UCF are complaining about students living in their communities and taking up all the parking spaces because everyone living in one house. So by working with the development with student housing, that's been one way that I've been supporting the university. Okay, and Mike Miller, that question to you. Well, I think the county could actually maybe broadcast the games on Orange TV. That would be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, seriously, I, and I do agree with uh, Commissioner Bonilla. That, you know, with the with the traffic out there and the, and the, the you know Alafaya Trail and, and uh, University Boulevard being very wide uh, roads, pedestrian safety, bikeways, those are things that the county can really, really look out for the for the students. Uh, and you know, being a being a, a, bit, a large public university, they are going to be growing. They are going to continue to to attract students because of the beautiful place we live. So I do think working with the residents and actually trying to figure out a way to get, uh, you know, it, it would be considered new urbanism. I mean, it's going to be dense around UCF. That's what's going to happen. But if you can make the density such that people can have a safe uh, walkway or a safe bikeway to and from uh, their, their, their house or their apartment, that, that would be a great benefit to all involved because it would take pressure off the roads as long as they can get across them safely. And I think that's, that would be a great example of a new urbanism opportunity to, to create density in the right way, in the right place, so that it benefits the university and vice versa. The university would, uh, would be able to attract more and smarter students that we will ultimately hire in our jobs in the, in the county. Okay. The next question I want to ask you, uh, actually, the issue came up a little earlier in the debate, and that is affordable housing. What role should the county play, do you believe, in the affordable uh, housing crisis? And that question goes first to Emily Bonilla. Yeah, so I've been working with the National Association of Counties, looking at what other cities are doing for affordable housing. And what I'm finding is the the best approach is that, first of all, the county has to invest in affordable housing, something that previous boards haven't wanted to do. So I'm really happy to work with this board that we're finally pushing in that direction. One thing I said is that if we really want to make an impact, we're going to have to have $100 million invested. And so that's what we're doing now. Um, every year we're doing $10 million till we get to that. Another thing that I found in other cities, what they're doing is that they're doing mixed income housing. So you don't have just... Um, just all of it, affordable housing or low income, it's mixed. So I did ask them, well, the people who are paying full price, um, don't they complain? How do you get people to move in? And they said, that, well, they haven't had any issues with that, uh, which was surprising to me. But it's working there. And that's definitely something that we should be doing more here in Orange County. Mike Miller, the role the county should play in helping ease that affordable housing crisis? When I was elected in 2014 to the Florida legislature, it was one of the things I worked on the hardest. And I can tell you that in working with Mayor Dyer and working uh, with uh, then Mayor Jacobs 
Uh, they did a, a tri-county uh, study on homelessness and the housing situations in Central Florida. And I took that study and I went to work in figuring out how to, uh, to, to help with long-term homelessness, episodic homelessness, work on the funding for affordable housing, a lot of what I like to call attainable housing, because as, as we've talked earlier about, there's a lot of impact fees, a lot of things that go around building, building uh, houses in Central Florida, and we've got to be very cognizant about the price of a home, because you want to make it attainable for a family to live and, and raise their children. So I worked very hard, and especially in this pandemic right now, the funding that I worked on in the legislature to allow for local control, which is a very important part of the bill that I passed and is now law, that gives money to the communities like Orange County to be able to help with episodic uh, situations. You can't make a rent payment. You can't make a utility payment. I have allowed through that law that I passed in the legislature to help those families. So I think I would continue to do that exact same kind of thing as okay. your next commissioner. Okay, and Anjali Vaya, uh, what role do you think the county should play in, in helping ease that affordable housing crisis? Um, this is a big, big issue in Orange County, as we know. And um, I know there, um, you know, the task force did a great job um, that the mayor had had put together. And um, I would support those initiatives and ideas because I know it's going to take a few, you know, a few years for us to implement all the ideas that were put together by the task force. Um, we must increase the supply and quality of affordable housing um, and preserve the ex existing affordable housing. Um, some of the things that, you know, I would support is removing some of the reg regulatory barriers, um, diversifying the housing stock, like expanding the types of houses that are being um, constructed. Um, also implementing some incentives um, that promote the housing construction. Um, again, the proximity of the jobs, um, the transit, the services, these are all things that relate to affordable housing. And, and you know, again, we must um, have units that, you know, that again, work with the current um, low paying okay. um, jobs that we have. They need that. Thank you. Okay. Well, that concludes our East uh, Orlando Chamber of Commerce, Orange County District 5 debate. Each candidate now has a minute for closing remarks, and we'll start with Mike Miller. Well, again, thanks, Steve, for moderating, and thank you for the Chamber for, uh, for uh, hosting this. I do think, and, uh, and uh, WUCF, I do think that the most important thing that's come out of this, uh, this conversation today is that we have some challenges. There's no doubt. And, and as your next commissioner, I would hope to take the life's experience I have uh, raising my family here, working here for the past 20 some years, take the experience that I uh, had in the legislature, especially working on issues like uh, affordable housing and uh, bringing new and better businesses to Central Florida and protecting our unique way of life and the beautiful environment that we have here in Central Florida. I will work very hard as your next commissioner to do just that because ultimately my kids who are both off in college, I would like them to say, where else in the world could I live that's better than here? And I want them to say, you know what? There's no best, no place better than Orlando, Florida and Orange County. So thank you. I appreciate you having me. All right, Anjali Vai, you have a minute for your closing remarks. You know, my, I am the only business owner in this race, and my past has, has demonstrated that I've come through some very challenging times, and I understand what, um, I, I simply am here because I care. I care about the people, um, and I've achieved the American dream, and I want to just give back. Um, that's why I'm here. I'm not happy with um, the current commissioner, um, you know, and I'm not the one, um, I'm definitely not here um, office shopping, I'm not here for just a one issue um, politician either. I'm here to just serve, to be your public servant, to be there, to care about you and utilize my business experience as well as my te technology experience to bring back a stronger, safer community in District 5. And again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to have these conversations with you. All right. And finally, Emily Bonilla, your closing statement. Yeah, thank you. It's definitely been a, been a pleasure serving since 2016. And when people, they, they compliment me or say thank you, one of the words that they use to describe me is courageous. Because I am not afraid to go up against the status quo. I'm not afraid to fight for the people. And that's something I'm going to continue doing. And that's something that we're definitely going to need moving forward after this pandemic. Because like I keep saying, we cannot continue doing things the way we used to. And it's going to take courage to be able to 
to go against that status quo and realize that we do need to do things differently. And it's going to take some creativity, innovation, and thinking outside the box, all things which anyone who watches the meetings can see that I've been doing. So I look forward to another term and to serving the people and to keep being courageous to be able to fight against the status quo and fight for the people and what the needs of the people are. Thank you. All right. Well, primary day is August 18th. If any one candidate gets more than 50 percent of the vote, they will win outright. Otherwise, the top two from the primary will face each other in November's general election. Many thanks for joining us and make sure your voice is heard by getting out to vote in August. From all of us here at WUCF, goodbye for now. The East Orlando Chamber was proud to join forces with Business Force, UCF, the Orlando Law Group, and WUCF to present the 2020 debate for Orange County District 5 Commissioner. As the leading resource in business advocacy, community engagement, and regional connectivity, covering 440 square miles of East Orange County, the East Orlando Chamber of Commerce is dedicated to supporting strong government and the political process on behalf of businesses throughout Central Florida. Business Force is Florida's regional political action committee. The committee supports businesses and good government in Central Florida. And as a sponsor of this event, the Business Force board members want to thank the candidates and thank you for participating in the political process and watching this significant debate in Orange County. Thanks again on behalf of Business Force. The Orlando Law Group is a full service law firm supporting estate planning, family law, bankruptcy, business issues, and more. As a proud community member of Central Florida, the Orlando Law Group is committed to offering hands-on care with expert knowledge to each client they serve. We will teach you in a room. We will teach you now on Zoom. We will teach you in a house. We will teach you with a mouse. We will teach you here or there. We will teach you because we care.